I now want to hand over to Professor Anthony Paul Foley, who has joined us today from Albany Law School. And I just want to remind everyone that his work has appeared in a host of journals and publications, um, forging new lines of inquiry and antagonisms at the conjuncture of philosophy, aesthetics, politics, critical race theory, and the law. And I think his work not only challenges what legal theory might be today in its expansive and um, creative reach, but significantly in this, he asks us to think about how our lives are assembled, organized, and predicted through mediations such as popular culture, historical convention, and significantly, those beliefs and principles which we name as the law. His talk tonight is entitled Abolition and the Inversion of Surveillance. And um, I'd, like, I'd appreciate it if you could join me in welcoming Anthony's. <laughs> For that warm welcome. Uh, it's uh, fantastic to um, be here. I have above my head a picture of Tyree Nichols. I'm not going to start with a moment of silence. I think there are things that need to be said, and I hope um, to say them uh, in his uh, honor and in honor of the many thousands gone, not just uh, him, but maybe as a, in honor of the not one more. Prison looks like slavery. Policing looks like slavery. Prison looks like slavery because it is. Policing looks like slavery because it is. Slavery to segregation to the new Jim Crow isn't progress. It isn't even living. From 1619, from before 1619 to 2023, we have made no progress, none whatsoever. We haven't even lived to that time. Slavery is always fatal. And so we're here as Ghosts, as very beings. All this stuff that capital is throwing up around us, we should regard as a tomb. They were buried in a churchyard that we need to leave. Slavery is white over black, segregation is white over black. The new Jim Crow is white over black. White over black to white over black to white over black. isn't progress, it isn't life, it's just repetition, like a virus, the motionless movement of death perfecting itself. This endless perfection, this death that we have all already died, has as its gospel what the Situationist International used to call the spectacle. The spectacle, that's the system's endless hymn of self-praise belongs to another time, another temporality, not historical time. Historical time is the space of human development, and repetition is not development. Death is the end of the story. That's where we are, buried in the churchyard we need to leave. Spectacular time is something else. That's the time that is not lived. That's the moment the liar lies to himself. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me goes on. But we've been there 10,000 years. We've no less time to sing God's praise than when we first began. A spectacular time doesn't pass. Spectacular time is forever. Spectacular time can be invested traumatologically, can be thought of as trauma. But it is not real time, it is not historical time, it's not a space of human uh, development. If historical time is the space of human development, spectacular time, I will argue, is its grave. White over black to white over black to white over black. I 
I said before there are things to be said. Here are some of the things to be said that I want you to hold in your minds, and I'll repeat them at the end. Racism is always total. It takes a lot to see racism, because it takes a lot to see the totality. We, who are black, are the object, not the subject. We're the object in the field of vision, not the ones who see, but the ones who are seen. How did this field of vision come to be? It began in bloodshed. What began in bloodshed is sustained in hysterical blindness. Hysterical blindness and the compulsion to repeat. What we're seeing isn't the real. What we're seeing is the thing created by that inaugural trauma. Racism, which many of you are here to hear, to hear me talk about, racism is the symptom of oppression, not the sickness itself. Racism is the symptom of total oppression. The way the body, the way hearts, the way minds, the way feelings adjust themselves to situations of total oppression that are built on marking some to have with blackness, marking some to have not with whatever blackness is not. This sickness is a sickness onto death. Um, I want to share some fancy stuff from the Situationist International. Can I do that since this is art school? Yes, Fantastic. <laughs> Key to board begins with a passage from Forbach's The Essence of Christianity. But certainly for the present age, which prefers the sign to the thing signified, the copy to the original, fancy to reality, the appearance to the essence, Illusion only is sacred. Truth is profane. Okay. Sacredness is held to be enhanced in proportion as truth decreases and illusion increases. So that the highest degree of illusion comes to be the highest degree of sacredness. There are some things that we view as sacred. The surveillance I'm talking about, the eye whose gaze I'm talking about, is first the mind's eye, the way the mind is imprisoned, buried in that churchyard of uh, concepts no longer useful for a living. The prison and the police are things we use to see the world, and we shouldn't. The reason prison and policing seem so intractable is because they're stuck in our eyes. We see the world through the lens of policing and prison, and so can't see the world without those two institutions. We should abolish the prison and replace it with nothing. We should abolish policing and replace it with nothing. We have to leave this church that has us buried in its yard. That wasn't all situations. A bunch of it was me. I hope I used my voice to reflect the transition. Right. And I hope it just didn't drop off and become like less elegant somehow. <laughs> the, he's not even translating himself from the French. In societies where modern conditions of production prevail, all of life presents itself as an immense accumulation of spectacles. Everything that was directly lived is moved away into representation. Everything that was directly lived has moved away into representation. Our identities are representation. We don't even live who we are. That's why we're buried in the churchyard. The churchyard we need to leave. The representation. Like, how does race come to represent us? It begins in bloodshed. What began in bloodshed gets continued in hysterical blindness. Back to the situations. The images detached from every aspect of life fuse in a common stream in which the unity of life can no longer be reestablished. Reality, considered partially, unfolds in its own weird, I added that word, general unity. See how I clarified it? I think you'd have lost it if I hadn't said weird. Uh, general unity. It's a pseudo world of parts, an object of mere contemplation. The specialization of images of the world is completed in the autonomous image where the liar has lied to himself. 
The spectacle in general is the concrete inversion of life, is the autonomous movement of the non-living. And I, I hope that seemed to you to be delicately but wonderfully foreshadowed with the way I began by discussing slavery as death. If not, I'll say it again. Slavery is death, death only, and that continually. Law is the body of this death. I'm a lawyer, so I had to get to that part. The pursuit of justice, and therefore of equality, is the pursuit of law. Law, however fair in form, even if it comes to us as justice, cannot be a force for anything other than the reproduction of the death that gave birth to it. Legal relations are relations between people regarded as if some of those people were things. What is it we see in justice? This essay locates the dark design of our love of justice in this essay. It's just me talking. <laughs> like notes that I've scribbled. This is what it looks like. Um, the dark design of our love of justice in the relation between prison, policing, punishment, and uh, racism. Before there's law, there is trauma. Law is a repetition of its own inaugural event. The event that inaugurates the law and is its mystical source of authority, repeated as rule of law, repeated as equal protection, repeated as due process, repeated as justice, is murder. Law begins with the violence of tens of millions of murders and worse on an impossible, and therefore incomprehensible, and therefore traumatic scale. The creation of the illusory world of legal relations requires the smashing of the real. There is a middle passage, an undiscovered country, the end of the world and the beginning of another. The end of the real is the beginning of law. The original accumulation is a fatal shattering of the commons into master and slave in all manner of diversities. Capital is born dripping with blood from head to toe, from every pore with blood and dirt. Common flesh is divided and marked as white over black. For ownership, white. For dispossession, black. The marking is the beginning of diversity, and the tens of millions of murders it represents is traumatic. The scattered fragments of subjectivity run away. Unfortunately, the fragments run by way of repetition white over black, to white over black, to white over black. Capital is another word for the reproduction of the violence of the original accumulation. Marx calls it primitive accumulation. I, in my cooler moments, call it the primal scene of accumulation. So capital is another word for the violence of the original accumulation. Sweating blood and filth from every pore from head to toe, characterizes not only the birth of capital, but also its progress at every step. In the original accumulation, people are separated by the, from the means and the methods by which they have traditionally kept themselves alive. The original accumulation is a presupposition of capital. There's capital, so therefore there's a prior capital that was capitalized, and therefore a prior capitalization, and so on, until the first horde, until the original accumulation. Adam Smith describes, and I got bored at a certain point with Adam Smith. Uh, Adam Smith described the presupposition of capital as previous capital. The original accumulation, however, is not only the first stage. There's not even really a stage at all since it never ends. It is nevertheless useful to describe it as a stage because it is indeed a stage of power understanding of capital and capital logic. Accumulations have continued uh, from the middle of the passage to Operation Infinite Justice, precipitating slaves and wage workers and diversities all along the way. The fact of property means there was a marking of bodies as owners and dispossessed. Before the original accumulation, before ownership, all anyone owns is the skin we're all in. And that skin is common, holding us all together. The skin, the flesh we're in, the original commons is split into diversities. The existence of wages presupposes an original accumulation, a festival of violence, 
that separated the worker from the means of production. Every contract then presupposes the murders that must take place in order to make it seem free. Marx and Capital Volume 1 talks about the beginning of the modern era uh, in a, as a race-making moment, though Marx doesn't say it's a race-making moment. Now that I've said it's a race-making moment thrice, you'll be able to see it when I say that genocide in the Americas, colonialism in India, and the conversion of Africa into a hunting ground for the gathering of black skins are the halcyon markers of that of the modern age. Those are all race-making moments. Before that, there's a skin we're all in, the original continents. After that, it matters what color you are, because one color is to have, one color is to have not. The fragments of the original accumulation seemingly relate to each other according to contract, rather than force of traditional privileges. This is what we're told, right? We've moved from status to, status to contract. How fantastic. Um, each fragment having no past and no existence outside the market is just like every other fragment. Each fragment is assumed to be a possessor of commodities and as such a faithful reflection of every other fragment. Each fragment reflects to all others only what the mirror of the market will allow. And the mirror of the market allows only exchange, exchanges between exchangers as exchangers equal exchange between equals on freely agreed upon terms, meetings of minds and of hearts, but not bodies. Of course, some agents have only their bodies to sell, traumatized, literally beside or outside of themselves. The fragments sell their lives, their labor power, as if their lives were objects, mere things to be sold and not, in fact, their souls. I was hoping to hear who's and awesome at the alliteration in that. Okay, thank you, thank you. I've lost my place for the lack of enthusiasm. Yeah. Well, that won't help me. What Sandor Renzi wrote of the individual is true, writ large, um, of the shock of the original accumulation and the shocking exchange, life for death. In other words, living labor in exchange for dead or previously accumulated labor that the original accumulation makes possible. Sandor so Renzi writes of trauma, if the shocks increase in number during the development of the child, the number of various kinds of splits in the personality increase too, and soon it becomes extremely difficult to maintain contact without confusion with all the fragments, each of which behaves as a separate personality and yet does not know of even the existence of the others. Eventually it may arrive at a state which, continuing this picture of fragmentation, uh, one would be justified in calling atomization. This is what they tell us we are in Econ 201, microeconomics, like fragments of human beings. Marx says we can lose the sense of our species being, that there might come a moment where everyone's needs are no longer my imperatives, and vice versa, and that's where we have fallen apart, but we don't recognize ourselves as falling apart. We, the broken, think that we are free in this brokenness. The fragments, thus giving up the ghost, good, you with me, fantastic, do the propaganda work of capital, and free only within the fantasy world of the market, a fantasy that becomes the world, set themselves to the task of realizing their freedom within a context that can only give rise to tighter and heavier chains. Frenzy's discussion of the fragments or the split off ego, it's helpful in understanding the nature of the invisible hand that seems to bring the fragments together in a strange individual collectivity, a thing that makes no sense, this individual collectivity. What's the content of the split off ego? Frenzy writes, above all a tendency, perhaps a tendency to complete the action interrupted by shock. In order to be able to do this, a refusal to take notice of the injustice suffered and an assertion by means of wish-fulfilling mental images, 
by day and by night of what one considers just. In other words, ideational cognitive material limited to a tendency to repeat and to try to find a better solution. The content of the split-off ego is always as followed, follows. Natural development and spontaneity, protest against violence and injustice, uh, contemptuous, perhaps sarcastic and ironic obedience displayed in the face of domination, but inward knowledge that the violence has achieved nothing. It has altered only something objective, the decision-making process, but not the ego as such. Contentment with oneself for this accomplishment, the feeling of being bigger and cleverer, cleverer than the brute force, sudden insight into the greater coherence of the world order, the treatment of brute force as a kind of mental disorder, and even when this power is successful, the beginning of the desire to cure this mental disorder. Doesn't that sound like, we've got to work within the system? Mm -hmm. Like, I hear your anger, but we're going to get there. I've seen the promised land, right? We, we'll get to the mountaintop one day, not this day, but, but someday. Longevity has its place. Doesn't it sound like all of that? Displacing the thing you should have right now or fidelity to the machine that is oppressing you, and the machine that will condemn you forever uh, to repeat a violent machine, right? a collective Madsen family. When I get to the bottom, I go back to the top of the slide, where I stop and I turn and I go for a ride, till I get to the bottom when I see you again. Quoting the Beatles by Cole, which I guess only old people will recognize. <laughs> it was important to Charlie Madsen. He was a killer. <laughs> Slavery, colonialism, uh, genocide, the beginning of capital, uh, dedication to the machine means working within the system. Um, you will work to produce a text. The text will be a pretty picture of tomorrow's freedom. It'll be in words. The words will always contain gaps, conflicts, and ambiguities. And you, who are hated universally, will not be the interpreter of those words or the implementer of those words. Right? You will, in fact, have become truly the slave when you bow down in prayer for legal relief, thus raising the law above you as a god on earth and burying yourself in the churchyard that you and we need to leave. If you're not universally hated, you can't get it together to protest for your rights. Something has to make Jimi Hendrix say to Richie Havens, so, but we don't know each other. We don't even do the same kind of music. We're on opposite ends of Woodstock. I was looking around for who's, like, old people know what I'm talking about. But they're like all saying stock still. Like, I'm young, I'm hit by Woodstock. What is this? It's my parents' generation. The, uh, so. <laughs> what? Yes. <laughs> Okay, you're right, Coachella. I just want to really know what Coachella is. Something in the desert. <laughs> For people to recognize each other who don't even know each other, they have to be universally marked in some way. I can look at somebody who's black and know one thing about them that might be the main thing about them. Where you go in this reality, you will be treated as a black person. So we know each other, we can say hello. We don't know if we like anything, the, we, if we have anything in common, but I'm pretty sure we don't like slavery. Um, so we have that in common. Like, we have time to start running. We have that in common. Uh, and we have this in common if we're working within the machine. Uh, we're already dead and buried and worshiping the force, repeating the force that killed us and buried us in the yard, because we know, even as we bow down in legal relief, some part of us know, the unfragmented part that we're afraid to be in touch with, knows that since we're not the power, and we've abdicated our own power in bowing down in prayer for legal relief, that power which hates us, or we wouldn't have needed to be here on our knees praying for legal relief, is going to interpret um, this new text, whether it's an executive order, whether it's a win in court, whether it is a legislative act against us. They're going to look at the gaps, conflicts, and ambiguities and interpret them according to um, whatever gives them a thrill, 
Rembrandt finds the freedom, the strawberry hill of the mind. Right? The racism is, as I said to the students earlier, to the minds of the youth. Uh, a, a champagne supernova if you're in the front seat of the segregated bus. I feel all shivery inside. I feel like sparkly and and golden and I've got to get myself back to the land, like stardust in that front seat. Um, I feel like a winner without having done anything to win. I feel like an achievement has happened without me needing to achieve. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, in his book, Anti-Semite the Jew, said the beauty of anti-Semitism is the anti-Semite gets to win without, like, you don't get a varsity letter, you didn't, you didn't climb a mountain, you weren't telling fun of your jokes to the other person, you were just not Jewish. So you get to win. Um, so that's how it works in the front seat. But it's a sadistic pleasure, because it can only be achieved with the squirming and horror of the back seat. And it's in the back seat, we know that experience, right? Like, oh, I feel terrible. Not just, I understand the political dynamics at play here, or I see the economic exploitation. It's a feeling in your body. Like first there's oppression, then there's all the other stuff attendant to it. But the other stuff that's attendant to it is where we live, like in our bodies. And that's a feeling of horror in the back. This horror and ecstasy happens only in non-revolutionary situations. Because where the folks in the back say, oh, this is interesting, we're just gonna get our own buses, or maybe we're gonna have these buses, and tomorrow's bus, um, something's gonna happen to it. And tomorrow's bus station, something's gonna happen to it. Oh, is it on fire? Right, it turns out every plantation belongs to a match. So I'll say it again. Every plantation belongs to a match. People figure that out unless they've, they're already dead and buried. Right? Another word for it could be political melancholia. Right? Broken in heart and mind, condemning oneself to mere repetition. Uh, so the fragments of world smashing violence, uh, the world smashing violence of the original accumulation, experience themselves as individuals, the atomized individuals of the market. The original accumulation invisibly gathers them together with the force of the original and fatal shock. Each fragment imagines a just world. Each fragment imagines itself to be uninjured by imagining its completeness uh, as its individuality. Each sets out to set the world right, and by setting it right, continues to expand the world created by the original uh, accumulation. The dispossessed are dispossessed of the means and methods by which they have traditionally reproduced their lives and lifestyles. Slavery accomplishes this end, as does emancipation. Placed in peril, the dispossessed are presented with an offer they cannot refuse. The dispossessed are freed of possessions and thereby freed to work for those who now possess. The dispossessed may accept an offer to work as a slave for an owner. The worker remains a slave whether she's in bondage or free. After all is said and done, after the remains of the day's consumption of tools and materials have been calculated, the worker, slave or free, will receive something less than the value of what she produced. The wage slaves something less is her master's surplus value. But this case or that case may vary, but the general rule must hold, or else the rule of owners, the owner-worker relationship, collapses. Surplus value, free labor, is the sum and substance of the master's mastery, and it represents the real relationship in years and days and hours and minutes between master and slave. The latter work for free for the former. Surplus value is the value of the free worker's free work. It takes many murders, millions of murders, to smash the human into fragments of the sort that begin to imagine themselves as individuals, individuals as opposed to fragments only to be reassembled individually as factors of production, as objects, as sentient commodities. Only a slave would accept that offer. And such deals are the only ones on offer. 
owners who offer anything else soon cease to be owners. This is the meaning of free competition. Owners compete with each other. Owners who fail to extract surplus value from the dispossessed will fail in their free market competition with other owners. The original accumulation makes all of this self-evidence, and the self-evidence organizes the fragments. Slavery is perfected when the offer is accepted. I'm going to look at my timer. No, I didn't start it. <laughs> How OK am I, though? OK, fantastic. <laughs> I'm making assessments based on 10 minutes. Slavery is perfected when the offer is accepted by the fragment as a so-called free contract. Law is another word for the repetition of the inaugural violence of capital. The accumulation of capital on a world scale is made possible by world-smashing violence, the violence that destroys all scales and measures, the violence that collapses all reasons, the violence of the original accumulation cannot be understood within the horizon of its from, within that is to say, the juridical horizon. Violence we cannot comprehend is violence we cannot remember, but nothing is ever really lost. The violence we cannot remember is the violence we repeat, and law is the archive of our dispossession, the mode of our compulsive return to the primal scene of accumulation and the form of its repetition. Justice can't bear witness to his own birth. Uh, justice cannot bear to witness her own birth. Justice, because you have justice when there's deprivation. Justice cannot face such a violent scene and so the goddess blinds herself. Facing her own becoming with unseeing eyes, justice bears witness to her origins, her primal scene, only in the mode of repetition only in the mode of reproduction, only through the act of giving birth to the self-same violence by which she was created. Justice is blind to the inaugural violence of the law. Justice is the reproduction of the violence of her origin, the violence to which she is blind. Justice measures and destroys in equal measures. Justice balances a scale, and the violations are paid in violence. Justice is blind, and justice bal balances a scale. Justice carries a sword. Violence is paid what violence is due. Justice is always a return to the violence of the original accumulation. Justice returns to the original accumulation with unseeing eyes. It's with crime and punishment that the original, that the, it's with crime and punishment that the juridical, this is a, this is a quote now from uh, Evgeny Pashakanis, uh, my favorite Bolshevik. My favorite Bolsheviks were all executed by Stalin. Um, which is too bad. But the juridical. How's that so sophisticated? I'm not going to give you a long discourse on the revolution betrayed and the, the, the details of Trotsky or this or that thing. Um, I won't go on and on about how I'm with Kropotkin. And I think that Lenin might have been lying when he wrote State and Revolution because he wanted to seem a lot like the Soviets that had existed a hundred years before the Bolshevik revolutions. Energies were captured by the Bolsheviks. Maybe Stalin was inevitable. There were those letters Lenin wrote when he was having strokes toward the end. Comrade Stalin has the wrong temperament for all of this. Um, but Comrade Stalin may not have been a problem if the new economic program had never been something in people's minds. And if they'd stuck with the Soviets as a model, there's nothing like anarchist communism for a brilliant future. But, but who knows? I, 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 you know, my journeys into that are Ursula Le Guin, like the dispossessed, um, or Emma Goldman uh, reflections, or their reading and rereading uh, compulsively homage to Catalonia and focusing on uh, George Orwell's adventures. Spanish Civil War and the way that state capitalism in the form of the Soviet Union uh, betrayed the Spanish Revolution and just as brutally uh, displayed the, the, betrayed the Republic uh, just as uh, brutally as the capitalist countries. We were warned about it. Right? Maya, Danaya, Skaya, 
CLR James and Grace Lee before she was even Grace Lee Boggs and writing as the Johnson for I'm just doing this to be cool, huh? But writing the Johnson Forest tendency uh, told us that state capitalism, the USSR, and the People's Republic of China uh, were every bit as horrid um, as capitalist capitalism. Well, gosh, in view of the 10 minutes, I should do something a little bit different. Do you like that drama? Yeah. I just close it. I'm going to go off text now. Tell this away. Uh, I like doing that with drama rather than I'm a bad timer. I could have timed these pages out differently. The black plays a role that is perverse in the system. Right? Marxists don't always read Marx the way I just did, pointing to that race making moment that is the beginning of the modern era, this churchyard in which we are buried with objects. Uh, Marxists uh, look at that original uh, 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 accumulation, this uh, starting uh, point of capital, to point out ways in which workers are ripped off. It builds up to the worker going to uh, market, thinking himself or herself to be free and equal, and not realizing that the capital you might have as a worker is actually the skin that you're in. And when you're going to market against Monsanto and Xerox and Ford, <laughs> A million other companies, uh, you've got nothing to expect from the market, from the market but a hiding, a beatdown, a lashing, an entry. Frederick Douglass might have said uh, through the bloodstained gate. If you recall Frederick Douglass's discussion of how he came to understand himself a slave uh, through the beating of his aunt Esther. So, if all we're going to expect in the market is a beatdown, Marxist say to the workers, to the proletariat, to the uh, universal class. Uh, well, you've got to do more than that. We've got to overthrow this uh, wage system. Your, self, your freedom isn't freedom at all. You're just giving free work to the extent that you are unorganized because capital is organized. So we need to uh, band together. We have been not, we shall be all. If we band together with those power in a union, uh, then we can start down the road of uh, smashing capitalism. And that will be uh, great for us. Uh, but there are other workers within that, let's say the black worker, isn't even getting what the white workers are getting. The black worker's role in society is to be discriminated in every capacity imaginable. Wherever you go, you go as the black worker, universally discriminated against. And in that position, you become a master of equality. Right? The, 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 Mozart or Beethoven or uh, Einstein or uh, Frederick Douglass of equality, which is the thinking of the commodity. Right? This many watches equals this many sweaters equals this many cars equals this many tickets to a Broadway show equals this much air gel equals these super cool glasses. Um, an insane kind of thinking. Uh, how much does a stolen bicycle weigh in terms of weeks and days of imprisonment? Uh, we start thinking this equals this equals this, never realizing we're talking about absolute incommensurables. And so what we're doing is absolutely a cult, but we think it all makes sense because we've been made um, out of these same twisted materials. Uh, we are alienated from ourselves. The original dispossession smashed all weights and measures and rules and rhymes and reasons. Um, uh, we are insane in a system that is the same. A system that ignores human needs. So somebody can have a pile of sandwiches that go to the stratosphere while others stand around the table not eating. The black worker isn't even equal to the white worker in that and becomes uh, an agent of change within the system. Uh, here's the new equality. No one's listening to the black worker. The black worker is universally hated, unless things are falling apart. In which case, the folks who are most eloquent and elegant and have the most developed and sophisticated uh, ways of discussing equality might be listened to. Got a cold war going on? Are you losing hearts and minds of the emerging third world? 
Like, is it a problem when Che and Fidel stay at the Hotel Teresa in Harlem because as communists, they're not about to stay in segregated Manhattan hotels and all the down midtown hotels are segregated? Is it a problem when all the black people in Harlem are like, you know, uh, happy to see Che and Fidel and uh, uh, others um, up in Harlem? It is for the power elite, and so they will bring Southern segregation in check. Because if the future is winning hearts and minds of the emerging third world, then you're not going to win hearts and minds of the emerging third world if you're allowing uh, overt segregation uh, anywhere. So when things look to be falling apart, and they did look to be falling apart, remember 1954? Call and response time, because we're winding it up. 1954, I don't even remember it. I, would, I don't remember 1954. I'm not a million-year-old person. I don't remember it. But I read books, as you all do. The Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. Don't they repeat that and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it as if it made a difference in something? As if most children, as if most black children aren't going to majority, minority, and underfunded schools today, just as that. As if you can't segregate a school internally, as if there's not tracking everywhere, as if tokenism can't do even more work than absolute segregation, because tokenism looks like it's really ability tracking. But whereas segregation, you can at least go, well, they had a rule, no black people in the college class, and no black people in the advanced placement course. But where you have black people in the advanced placement course, but you just devise ways of making sure only two of them get there, you know, and one of them's nervous, then it looks like that's how it's sorted out, right? But then there must really be something wrong with that. And everyone takes that lesson to heart, even if they're against it. You can even teach the people segregated out into the not advanced classes to sing the same song. Um, well, uh, life was very cruel to me, and that's why I'm in this lower class. Um, not realizing that's not why you're in the lower class. You're in that lower class because they put you there and they tricked you. So, when there's a crisis, people might listen to black people for a second and embrace their poetry, right? We've got a Martin Luther King Day, don't we? King said in 1968, come summer, we're ending poverty. And if there are any American institutions in the way of that, those institutions have to go. And not just here, worldwide. And by the way, April 4, 1967, King made it clear, I'm with the Viet Cong fighting against US imperialism. American capitalism, Militarism and racism are three facets of the same thing. You can't get rid of any one without getting rid of the other two. That's why April 3, 1968, King knew, well, I guess tomorrow's it then. Right? That's the, that would be the one year anniversary of my coming out uh, uh, as a person ready to pay the cost of discipleship. So I guess crucifixion day is tomorrow, which it was. We don't make a lot of that obvious one year, April 4 to April 4, 67 to 68, and then you never got to see that summer. We even tell stories of, in a reversal, like in the common parlance of MLK, somehow Malcolm X comes around to some soft position, but in fact it is the opposite. We don't learn that MLK met with Tommy Smith and John Carlos. Um, you never got to see it, but he met with them in the build-up to the Mexico City and when they came to black power protest and he was with them. So that king um, uh, had to go and knew he had to go, but black people do get this into when there's a crisis, but not really, because we get, we get Martin Luther King 1963 soft pedaled over and over again um, every January, every January. That's not where we need to be. So, the thing I've been trying to argue, I think, is a new way of seeing, of leaving the spectacle, re-entering historical time. The way we do that is by 
seeing what's before our eyes, not before blind justice, not crying out for justice, because justice has limits, it has measures. Uh, there are degrees of it, and those are all degrees measured by the system. Anyone get justice from their parents or their loved ones? I don't want justice. I was playing baseball in the house again. The window's broken again. I don't want justice, mom and dad. Look, I want you to recognize that I was brought into the world to be loved. Look, love is patient, love is kind. I want all of that stuff. Anyone want what they deserve? <laughs> Meeting out to other people what they deserve? I don't want what I deserve. I'm an abolitionist now, but I was once a federal prosecutor. I don't want what I deserve, what I have coming. I was a corporate lawyer before that. I've committed a great many sins. You ever go somewhere and have your Pepsi Cola and have it ruined because you've gone somewhere on vacation that's cheap, and then someone says, please, sir, and you're like, ah, oh, I hate poverty. I'm a communist, I'm an anarchist. I just want to drink my cola, though, and enjoy my beach wear and turn this tiger's tooth plastic necklace into margaritas at the swimming pool bar. Like, without having to deal with all this corrugated tin roof stuff. I'm a really bad communist. I am one, but I also have to turn myself in the common revolution. So I hope it's kind. Not a revolution of justice, but a revolution of being in touch with our species uh, being. Of refusing to be the object that is seen and being the subject that sees, that we see with our own human eyes that this churchyard in which we are buried is one we must leave. And the way we leave it is by saying no to policing, not no uh, to prison. Thank you. questions because I'm sure you've got some things you're going to ask Anthony and um, we don't have so much time but I do want enough time so everyone can feel they can ask so please put your hand up, sh shout out and we can go on. And if not I'm going to ask a question. <laughs> can we have a moment of digestion? <laughs> For sure, I will, I will cover that. I, I, I've um, I was fascinated, Anthony, by many things you were talking about, but I, I wanted just to pick up on this question of, or the description of how the law prescribes the limit um, and represses this at the same time. There's a kind of repressive apparatus that the law prosecutes. And, you know, it, 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 I think in terms of what you're saying, it, it doesn't allow us to recognize the law as a limit. Um, because of that repression, and instead it makes us kind of, we're convinced that there's nothing else but law. Um, and that's what I was understanding from how you, your description operated, and it, it kind of reminded me, and it's kind of something you didn't talk about tonight, but I was hovering my head with Hobbes' Leviathan. Yes. You know, this amazing image of, I'm sure everybody knows, the frontispiece of the Hobbes' Leviathan book, um, which is the king, the kinky body, full of all the tiny people. And of course, it's the contract, it's the covenant, um, which convinces us all that um, the if you didn't have the image of the we as the one um, under the name of sovereign law, we would all kill each other. We would we would all just, um, it would be a bell and on this open, it's a war of all against all. And, and, and your talk made me think about that fear that the law holds for us, like the, the other side of the law being this um, terrible anarchism, let's say, this um, lawless space. Um, and I was wondering if you've got anything to say just about that, but also the fact that this is an image. This is a, an image that we know, it's um, a famous image, um, uh, and it mediates the law precisely. And I was wondering if you'd ever, or, or in your talk, you know, you, you were thinking about 
Um, you know, that image is an is a act of violence. Um, images are violent, I would say. And, I, and it's oppressive um, and repressive. Do you think that there are images that can be had that are, yes, violent, but emancipatory in, in another sense? And, and, you know, that goes back to your kind of critique of spectacle and, you know, as well, which is the world as image and the theology of illusion. So I just wondered if there was a kind of resource for images in, in an emancipatory sense, which could also be violent, um, as opposed to, say, the operation of the image as the product of the we to the one that is this image of law that I often think of, if that makes sense. I'm not... Um, I think it does. Yeah. So. That's being a good guest, yes. and, genu and genuine. So, the, uh, like C.B. McPherson's introduction to Hobbes' Leviathan, he talks about the possessive individualism that is assumed to be just part of, um, you know, what others have referred to as the crooked timber of humanity, right? Fallen humankind can't get together. If, 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 but for the law, if I wanted that chocolate bar, I would stab you in your heart and take it. Right, that's that's how it works. Like that's who we are. Like all psych psychopaths are. So we assume the psychopath to be the whole, and in that world, right, the um, uh, it all makes sense. Uh, the, the Leviathan uh, put in place there, of course, to maintain class terror gets viewed as keeping us all in order. Because otherwise, what the psychopathic one percent feel and are. Uh, in fact, the people piling sandwiches to the stratosphere while others starve, like what's inside them, which is nothing. Right? What's inside them, which is nothing, um, is presumed to be inside the rest of us. And so we then weirdly, assuming humanity to be that psychopathic 1%, uh, allow the psychopathic 1% to have power over the rest of us and call it not just justice, but call it inevitable. Right? It's the only way. Otherwise, life will be solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Um, only life is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short under that kind of regime where we presume a thing we all know deeply is wrong. Possessive individualism cannot produce a human being. It might produce like Hitler or Trump or Charlie Manson, but it cannot produce a human being. Uh, Lawrence Thomas, um, in a book called, uh, one of my favorite books, uh, the, the, Lawrence Thomas, a philosopher to whom everyone should pay attention, uh, talks about the fact that we regard altruism as something rare or irrelevant. Political scientists don't write about altruism, really. Um, economists don't write about altruism, really. But everybody who's ever been a child of a loving, uh, uh, parent or parental figure knows about altruism. Everyone who's ever had a child knows about altruism. You don't become a human being unless somebody looks at you and loves you and you imitate a coherence that you don't have yet. Right? Lacan's discussion of the mirror stage isn't exactly a discussion of love, but it is. Right? It's as the beloved we all come to be and I. I talk about seeing, but this is the other. Just Think about mind that can perceive things. We are borrowing something um, from the person that loves us at some stage or other. The, we learn, we know we're not getting stuff because we earned it, right? The, we know we're not getting stuff because we deserve it. We're getting stuff because people love us and have given it to us as a gift that gives us the right emotional kind of imprimatur. Right? We, can, we can value ourselves when we're valued that way. When we're valued that way, we can value others. We can see that love isn't a commodity, right? because if you have siblings, they, the fact that they're loved doesn't mean you are loved less. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't have to mean you are loved less. Uh, that is, you get a sense of abundance right? as the ultimate reality and not of uh, scarcity. So I think that we get our eyes put out by the kind of miserable justice that's presented to us. Like, let's apportion this by equally, or roughly equally, or uh, 1%. And 
99% of it for me, and the rest of you fight over the scraps. But it all ends that way because we're talking about psychotic measures. Okay, when we're not talking about human needs, what are we talking about? You know, we're all part of Sanders' problem the stratosphere, and there are scrawny people waiting to, like, you know, tie your bib on for you. If you've lived a thousand lifetimes, you couldn't eat all those sandwiches. Why, why do you have them? You've gone mad. Why are we going to organize around you going mad? Why don't we care about the, well, I want to keep going other questions. So this, this is something that can go on with El Castro style. <laughs> Forever. And I want to stay in the Che Guevara. It's all movie full of possibility moment. <laughs> The class liberation of which would mean the liberation of all classes. The class that couldn't get free unless it liberated everybody. So I think there's a special place for black people because they're super hated. But no one's going to fight for that special place. So if there are other groups that feel they're in that special place, you know, welcome to the revolution. That's great. I, I talked earlier to the fantastic students about Huey Newton's idea of intercommunalism as a fact of the political landscape um, and also as a practice of revolution. So Huey Newton wrote about, think about groups, so the talking of the Panthers, think about groups that we don't like. The groups that we don't like, when we don't like them, is our not liking them helpful to the cause of communist revolution, black communist revolution in our time? If yes, then go on and disliking them. If no, then you gotta question that emotion. And in fact, use that emotion as a signal to reach out to that group and um, uh, make deals, make ties, uh, bind ourselves to that uh, uh, group more tightly. Because if we're hating them for no reason, like if hating them isn't helping our revolution, and that's a way in which the system's thinking has buried itself in our heads. And that is what we can use, blinded as we are by all that dirt we're buried under in the churchyard that we must leave. That's a signal we can use to figure out um, how to bring this all down. So that's in universal dislike, that's the, the connotation. Uh, I like the idea of universal dislike, but I also mean that group the group that cannot free itself without freeing everybody. Oh, okay. Okay. Right, if you think about the Civil War, right? Americans who didn't own slaves, whose livelihoods were, they understood their livelihoods were damaged by the existence of slavery. Right? Um, were willing to fight and die to keep black people in slavery. Right, that champagne supernova, that ecstasy in one's body that is the, the feeling that comes to us after the oppression has happened was so intense that people were willing to give up everything to maintain it. And say so too with segregation. Gosh, what did people want to build a, war, a, a wall for? Like, remember, I think it was Donald Trump that said, or somebody related to Donald Trump said, we don't build a wall, there'll be two taco trucks on every corner. And you think, wait, that would be a problem for what reason? Um, <laughs> how, like, how, like, how, but also, how willing to pay do you have to be to not want two taco trucks on every corner? <laughs> it's, it's one of those things where okay, you're, you're in a whole world, right? It's a whole vibe, I guess. That's me, being, that's me recovering from my earlier Woodstock books. It's a vibe. It's me solidly in 2023. Yeah. And I just, I know we've got a question and um, we'll go to that next, but I, I just want to, there's a kind of interesting irony around the, the kind of permanence of the bourgeoisie is that they'll give up everything but property, you know, in the context of what you've just said on to me. So we've got a question over here. Hi, Professor. Do you think in like any kind of world, future, science fiction, law can be like liberatory? Uh, no, um, I, I don't think so. I, I think that 
what we think of as law is things that are authorized by that original accumulation. You know, Blackstone calls it time out of mind. That's where the authority of common law systems comes from. Like things that we have practiced since the memory of mind, the memory of man, run up not to the contrary, are the things that are most authorized by law. Um, if we look at civil systems as opposed to common law systems, um, uh, we can read Kelsen. Kelsen talks about the ground norm, right? Every legal norm hangs on some other norm that authorizes on another one, on another one, until you get to the ground norm, which is rather, which is just like the, the memory of man running not, run up, not to the contrary, just the, it is it's the navel of the dream, the place beyond which interpretation cannot go. And that place beyond which interpretations or legal authorities cannot go, this navel of the dream, so to speak, is um, conquest. But you don't get reparations for what you are. Right? When you're black, like you were made so by slavery. When you're colonized, you were made so by colonialism. When you're the native, colonialism made you the native. And genocide um, is genocide. Uh, you, you don't get reparations in a legal system, and not real ones, for that. The thing that makes a legal system a legal system, I argue, is the way it, it one is stopped from going beyond that point, that point of the uh, tens of millions of murders on an incomprehensible, and therefore unthinkable, and therefore traumatic, and therefore endlessly repeated scale. So, uh, no, what we call law isn't what goes on at home, if you got a nice home, like uh, you, you don't run it by law. Like you uh, have a rule of love where you've taught people in your family, have taught each other how to feel others' needs as their own, how to also get a sense of the group as a group and group needs. Now, I don't want to say this as if I'm someone who feels group needs. I'm in fact in my real life pretty insensitive, <laughs> but I know what's going on. I know what's going on. But, you know, like a bunch of people want to go somewhere. Should we walk to the movie? Should we take a taxi cab? I'm like, it's raining. Let's just let's just take a taxi. God damn it! God damn it. <laughs> We're talking endlessly. This this talk is going on forever. Why are we sorting out everyone's feelings? And then I, then I stop myself because I'm realizing I'm sounding like Trump. So so I stop myself and I sound like those guys. Like, oh, remember you're a communist. But bad one. The worst crime. I'm gonna pretend to be a good one. Yeah, let's talk more about feelings and go on and walk until the whole group is happy. Um, the in Alexander Bogdanov in um, Red Star. Is it Red Star or Red Planet? In Red Star, there's a moment in communist science fiction, which I love. But there's a moment when the communist society on Mars that Bogdanov is uh, the thought of. Uh, has the realization that we, as the first generation of people who defeated capitalism, are still infected with capitalism. So what the, you know, what Oscar Wilde once called the soul of man uh, under socialism, uh, that's a thing yet to be seen, right? So we still have to monitor ourselves with the people who smashed capitalism. Not we in this room, but in the, as it turned out, Bob Lahab was correct. Right? The, uh, the first group has to monitor itself because it still has these infections, um, but it can imagine something different. So I can imagine a solidarity even if I don't always enjoy it. Right? Like I, I, I love anarchist ideals and ways of being, though I would probably have library books hoarded in my cubicle that I won't tell anybody about. And I think that's okay. No system is flawless, but some systems won't deprive us of breathable air by 2099. We've got time for one more question. Yes. Without measure, which I think is where you were going. Um, but 
but I'm trying to I'm to relate that to the problem of naming. Because I suppose you can interpret the law, no as as naming, as a function of naming. And so I wonder what your thoughts are on on what a materialist naming process would be. Because an idealist naming process has led to all the That's a great question. Um, Could we rephrase the question a bit for the city? Um, law might be thought of as naming. There's a way in which a certain kind of idealist naming has led to all manner of horrors. What would a materialist uh, kind of naming uh, look like? I think it might look like not having a shadow between the need and its satisfaction, right? Take the, oh, oh, do you guys need stuff? Okay, well, there's this rule now that we'll have to think about that will determine whether or not you get what you need, as opposed to our, our organizing to make sure that you get what you need. The um, theologian Gustavo Gutierrez um, wrote a theology of liberation, once gave a series of lectures at Boston College that I attended and he related this um, uh, story. My memory was to me, but it might have been to everybody. But let me just say it was to me so I can feel special and like I'm just hanging out with the liberation of theologians. Um, he talked about memories of childhood and being poor, and his father often returning home with just some candy for them. It was beyond what they could afford something outside of the plan, but it was beautiful for them, and they remember it more than sticking to the plan uh, uh, would have. There's a, a epimethean, there's Prometheus, there's epimethean. We just give stuff away and not measure how much stuff I've got to give. Um, there are ways in which hardships, when shared, this, this is terrible, okay, not now being hypocritical, but hardship, this is the person I want to be speaking about. Um, uh, hardships, when shared, aren't the hardships they um, are when they are not shared. Right? So there are ways in which even when cruel things happen, um, when, even when terrible things happen, when we're all in it together, it doesn't have that weird, uh, that weird, abominable, that feeling of just, there's no one looking after me now. Like nobody cares. It's just me. Like time to. You know when they teach us myths like Romulus and Remus, like founders of Rome, like empire begins this way. Yeah, maybe it does. It begins with this psychotic story of leaving children in the woods and imagining that they're not just meat now, right? A child baby left in the woods <laughs> is just a sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> um, not, not a person. We all come into the world actually cared for, but the greats want to tell us some other story. I'm like raised by wolves. You know, that, that's me, right? Sweeping their hair back and doing whatever it is that you do when you're, when you're a great. So I think a materialist vision, at least to mine, would be getting rid of all these rhetorics of scarcity and deprivation, uh, establishing a more Epimethean uh, attitude. Uh, organizing ourselves around human needs. So what might look like law is really, as Pasha Khan says, just a train schedule. Like where we're just organizing the project. Like, oh, are there, are there lead paint somewhere? We need to get rid of that. Is every black kid in America almost drinking, and every white kid, like Eminem maybe, like poor enough to be near those black kids drinking lead tainted water? Yes. Would it cost very much to fix it? No. We, uh, do we have a million, there's still, Lead, lead in everybody's water in Flint, Michigan. Are there a million shadows between the fulfillment of an obvious need, like a generational brain damaging weapon used against um, poor people, especially black people everywhere? You know, the lead that you drink as a little kid sinks into your bones. And if you're a little girl, when you get the lead sunk into your bones, that lead goes to the bones of the daughter you might have or the son you might have later. 
and all that. So these mind bombs are everywhere. So I think the, the material is vision, is what I imagine. Is that, is taking care of the actual need. Right. Well, I just want to jump in there and just huge thank you, Anthony, for coming all the way over from the East Coast tonight, or yesterday, and you haven't slept. I have not slept. And, and he's kept going, going. <laughs> and with the MA Aesthetics and Politics students, thank them today for coming to the seminar and for you to lead that seminar, Anthony. It was wonderful. And thanks for the whole audience for coming tonight and listening. And we will be back in a month's time, so I hope you can make it again. We'll continue these conversations, but within a different landscape. Um, and so I hope you all have an amazing um, night and a safe trip home. And um, see you again soon, I hope. Thank you, Anthony.